Welcome to the third CREOC module on caring for transgender and gender non-conforming patients for the obstetrician gynecologist. These modules were created with the support of the CREOG Empower Award and with the support of University of Michigan Medicine. Module three, gender affirming care. Gender affirming treatment, also known as transition related care or medical transition, is the process of assisting transgender people with medical treatments to physically express their gender identities. These treatments can include hormonal treatments, which affect the secondary sex characteristics of an individual and surgical treatments to change body contours or genitalia. Gender affirming treatment has been shown to improve mental health outcomes, including depression and suicidal ideation amongst transgender individuals. However, it is important to note that one does not have to undergo any medical treatment to be transgender, and that many people will decide to only undergo some or none of these treatments. There is no one way to transition. Different people need different things. Hormonal management for transgender and gender non-conforming individuals. Transmasculine people may use testosterone or T to gain masculine secondary sex characteristics. Transfeminine people may use estrogen along with androgen blockers to gain female secondary sex characteristics. While some transgender women have advocated for the use of progesterone treatment, there is no evidence for any benefit and there may be increased risk of breast cancer. The major goals of hormone therapy are to reduce endogenous sex hormone levels and to replace them with exogenous sex hormones. Hormone therapy follows the same principles of hormone replacement treatment in hypogonadal patients, allowing for the development of secondary sex characteristics congruent with the individual's gender identity. Initiating hormone therapy. The initiation of hormone therapy should follow an extensive discussion with the patient about goals, expectations, and risks and side effects, acknowledging the limitations of currently available data. Most guidelines currently recommend a documented prior evaluation and counseling by a mental health provider. This evaluation assesses the appropriateness of hormonal care for the treatment of the individual's gender dysphoria. However, many providers and patients advocate for the use of an informed consent model. This model seeks to acknowledge and better support the patient's right to and capability for personal autonomy in choosing care. According to WPATH, or the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the criteria for gender-affirming hormone therapy in adults are persistent, well-documented gender dysphoria or gender incongruence, the capacity to make a fully informed decision and to consent for treatment, mental health concerns, if present, must be reasonably well-controlled. There are multiple options for prescribing testosterone. The most common form of prescribed testosterone available in the US is either testosterone cipionate or testosterone enanthate, which can be given either intramuscularly or subcutaneously, typically in a weekly dosage. Typical doses range from 40 to 120 milligrams a week. One should aim for mid male range of both testosterone and estradiol and for a hematocrit of less than 50%. One should adjust clinically. For example, some patients may get mood changes in the days before injection. A small increase in dose can eliminate this. When initiating testosterone therapy, aim for the therapeutic dose from the start to avoid intermittent bleeding and spotting that can be seen when using low doses of testosterone. It is worthwhile alerting the patient to expect a puberty-like process. Facial hair growth for transgender men or breast development for trans women can take up to two years for full effect. Transdermal administration using gel is an alternative for those who want to avoid injections. It does require daily administration, is more expensive, and requires care when coming into skin-to-skin -skin contact with other individuals or sharing a hot tub or pool. It also tends to have a slower, more subtle masculinizing effect and might cause bleeding or spotting in some individuals. Effects of testosterone include the following. 
Permanent changes include voice deepening, clitoral enlargement, and male pattern baldness, depending on the genetics of the individual. Increase in terminal facial hair and body hair can take up to five years to stabilize, and an equal time frame to resolve if testosterone is discontinued. Reversible changes include body fat redistribution, increase in muscle mass, increase in skin thickness, acne, and cessation of menstrual bleeding. Most transgender men will achieve amenorrhea within a few months of testosterone treatment. Ongoing bleeding or spotting in the presence of male range testosterone levels with adequate estrogen suppression may require further investigation. This may include ultrasound to assess endometrial thickness or an endometrial biopsy. In the first year of treatment, one should monitor total testosterone and hematocrit every three months. After the first year, annual monitoring is sufficient. In complex cases, it may be helpful to monitor albumin and SHBG every three months in the first year. In some cases, testosterone use may be associated with the following. Overthrocytosis or a hematocrit greater than 50%. Severe liver dysfunction, transaminesis greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Hypertension, increase in LDL and decrease in HDL levels, increased visceral fat and decrease in fasting glucose, which indirectly contribute to the risk of cardiovascular disease. However, there is currently no evidence for an increase in cardiovascular events in transgender men. If your patient presents with symptoms, reduction in dosage may be warranted. Keep in mind that many transgender people are wary of being cut off from hormone therapy entirely. So it is essential to discuss risks and benefits of any dosage change with your patients where problems arise in order to keep them retained in care. Monitoring testosterone therapy. Various protocols have been suggested for the monitoring of masculinizing therapy. The goal of monitoring is to ensure safety and that the therapy is adequate for maintenance of hormones in the male range. Monitoring should include a CBC to ensure that the hematocrit is not excessively elevated, a comprehensive metabolic profile, and testosterone and estradiol levels. While initial testing may be more frequent, such as at the three-month interval, with the stabilization of dosage, the frequency of testing can be gradually reduced to once annually. For an example of a protocol, see the UCSF Center of Excellence website. Hormone therapy for transgender women. Obstetrician gynecologists are well positioned to provide gender affirming care to trans women. OBGYNs have experience and knowledge of prescribing estrogen in many different contexts including suppression of androgenic hormones, such as in treatment for PCOS. Additionally, obstetrician gynecologists can be vital to increasing transgender women's access to receiving affirming care. Hormone therapy for transgender women will usually include an androgen blocker and estrogen. In this case too, the aim is for physiologic female levels of testosterone and estrogen. Available routes of estrogen administration will include oral, sublingual, intramuscular, and transdermal. Here are some hormone regimens for transgender women. In most cases, we will prescribe an anti-androgen along with estrogen. Effects of estrogen include decreased body and facial hair, a decrease in libido and loss of spontaneous erections, a reduction in muscle mass, and fat redistribution. Breast development can be expected within three to six months and usually peaks by two years. Adverse effects of estrogen. The major concerns with use of high doses of estrogen are for an increase in cardiovascular disease, thromboembolic disease, and stroke. There is no evidence for increased risk of breast cancer. Transdermally administered estrogen is associated with lower rates of venous thromboembolism, it may hence be the preferred option for transgender women with cardiovascular risk factors or established cardiovascular disease. If using spironolactone as an anti-androgen, keep in mind that this medication is a potassium sparing diuretic and patients should be counseled about symptoms of hypotension and dehydration. Anti-androgens can be discontinued following gonadectomy and estrogen doses can be reduced.
monitoring feminizing hormone therapy. As with masculinizing therapy for transgender men, various protocols have been suggested for the monitoring of feminizing therapy with gradually increasing intervals of testing. For an example of a protocol, see the UCSF Center of Excellence website. Sexual function and fertility. Hormone therapy can impact sex drive and arousal. Testosterone may increase libido among transgender men. Both androgen blockers and estrogen use among transgender women will lead to decrease in spontaneous erections and may affect sex drive and ability to sustain an erection. These issues should be discussed with patients. Prior to initiating hormone therapy, providers and patients should discuss fertility and family planning issues. Please refer to module four on gynecological care for further detail. For transgender men, testosterone is not adequate birth control, even with cessation of menses and has teratogenic potential. Options for contraception, if engaging in penetrative intercourse with pregnancy potential, include progesterone only pills, subdermal implants, IUDs, injectable progesterone or condoms. There are currently limited data on the long-term effects of testosterone on ovarian function, reserve and fertility. Anecdotal data report transgender men who have conceived spontaneously following cessation of testosterone treatment. However, it is not known whether transmasculine individuals can routinely expect to be able to carry pregnancies or harvest gametes following testosterone treatment. For transgender women, androgen blockers and estrogen therapy will decrease sperm counts. These effects are reversible. However, it may require three to six months. It is important that providers discuss fertility preservation with patients prior to initiation of hormone treatment and prior to surgical removal of gonads. Transgender and gender nonconforming youth, GNRH agonists. In transgender adolescents, endogenous puberty can cause significant distress. Additionally, some physical changes affected by endogenous hormones are either permanent or difficult to reverse when a person transitions after puberty. GNRH agonists can be useful in those cases to delay puberty. These are usually started when the adolescent is at TANA stage two, enabling the delay of endogenous puberty until the adolescent and their family are ready to initiate gender-affirming sex steroid treatment. For further information on care for transgender children and adolescents, please refer to the Endocrine Society guidelines and to the UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health guidelines. Surgical options. Many transgender individuals will seek surgery as part of aligning their physical body to their affirmed gender. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health Standards of Care require mental health provider referral letters for surgical options. One referral letter is required for breast chest surgery, such as mastectomy, chest reconstruction, and augmentation mammoplasty. Two referral letters and usually 12 continuous months of hormone treatment are required for genital surgeries, such as hysterectomy, salpingo-oophorectomy, orchiectomy, and genital reconstructive surgery. Additionally, per WPATH, Genital reconstructive surgeries, including metoidioplasty, phalloplasty, and vaginoplasty, require 12 months of living in the gender role congruent with one's gender identity. It is important to stress that these guidelines are general principles and treatment should always be individualized. Some providers are moving toward an informed consent model. At this point, however, most insurance companies do still require letters prior to authorization of coverage. So for patients with insurance coverage, letters will likely be needed. Options for gender affirming surgery for transmasculine people include top surgery, bilateral mastectomy, and bottom surgery. Bottom surgery may include a hysterectomy with or without gonads and tubes, colpectomy or vaginectomy, phalloplasty, which is the creation of a neophallus from a flap, usually forearm or thigh. This can be done with or without a penile implant, scrotal implants, or a urethral hookup. Lastly, there is metoidioplasty, also known as meta or meto, in which the crura of an enlarged clitoris are released to increase length. For trans women, options include top surgery, breast reconstruction, including implants, 
bottom surgeries, vaginoplasty, penectomy or archaeectomy, and other ancillary procedures such as electrolysis or hair removal, facial reconstruction, and chondrolaryngoplasty, which is commonly known as a tracheal shave. Effects of body contour practices. There are several practices that transgender people may use to alter their body contours, which may affect their health or be notable upon physical exams. These include binding. This is the flattening of the transmasculine chest using tape, ace bandages, tight fitting or layered garments, or a specially designed binder. While there is no evidence that binding is itself a harmful practice, depending on the tightness and material or technique used, it may restrict breathing, increase acne underneath the binder, or cause skin irritation or fungal skin infections. Trans men should be advised to avoid overnight binding. Long-term binding may result in muscle imbalances or weaknesses in the chest and back. Tucking. This entails pushing the testicles upward in the inguinal canal, allowing one to flatten the penis and scrotum backward toward the perineum. This is done in order to achieve a flat crotch appearance. Anecdotally, this may lead to urinary tract infections and local pain, especially if prolonged. Silicone and other fillers. This is often injected by transgender women to achieve rapid and significant augmentation to breasts, hips, and buttocks. These injections are often performed in unsupervised, non-sterile settings and may include a variety of substances. Risks include embolization, which can lead to ARDS, infection, local inflammation, erosion and necrosis, migration and deformation, and granuloma formation. When treating transgender women for otherwise unexplained inflammatory or embolic conditions, remember to consider complications of filler injections, either recent or remote, in your differential diagnosis. Gender affirming treatment is medically necessary and at times life saving for appropriate candidates. Treatment can include hormones, surgeries, or both. It is important to review expected changes, risks, alternatives, and regimen options, as well as contraception and fertility preservation options with patients prior to initiation of treatment. Thank you for listening. This concludes module three.